Good morning, Bread of Life. God's love and his peace and his mercy be with you all today. We're moving through this series of the Ten Commandments, and we're now on um, the Fourth Commandment, the Sabbath. You know that card in Monopoly. I assume most of us in the church have played um, Monopoly in our lives or are very familiar with it. And in, in, in the chance deck or in the um, community chest, there's the little card, uh, go directly to jail. Do not collect $200. Do not pass go. Um, that um, killer of the game when you have momentum uh, to be stuck without a turn and to lose your opportunity uh, to continue to advance. That, I think, is probably close to most people's sense of this law of the Sabbath. We can't understand worshiping God or um, not committing adultery and honoring our parents, but when it comes to a day set aside where we can't have fun, that's what we think of the Sabbath as, a big no to our own pleasures, to doing anything fun. And um, that really, if you study the Sabbath, and we'll look at it very briefly today, it really has nothing to do with what God's commanding. Some people blame the Puritans for that image, and it's probably not true to them. But nevertheless, here it is. We have kind of a negative leaning towards this one day that seems to put a demand on us. Well, I want to just go through it and divide it up into three um, ways of examining or looking at the Sabbath day. It has um, There are two versions to the Sabbath, and the two versions give two motivations or reasons that we should keep it. There are two commands in the Sabbath. There's two things we're to do, that the only law that's like that. And there are two rests that the Sabbath imagines that we should be called to. It is, as we go into it, it's the longest commandment by far in the Ten Commandments. It is, far from the first commandment, the most emphasized across Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. So these three aspects of the law deserve our attention. Okay, so we start with the fact that there are two versions to this law. If you're following these sermons, um, I hope you are, then you know that there are two um, lists of the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments in Scripture, one in Exodus 20 and one in Deuteronomy 5. Most people think the one in Exodus is older. It is slightly shorter than the one in Deuteronomy. And when it comes to the reason or the motivation, we call them motivation clauses in the law that are given, the motivation for keeping the Sabbath in Exodus is this. For in six days your Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore you shall keep the Sabbath. So that the motivation for keeping the Sabbath in Exodus is the creation. It's the created order, the universal kind of structure of the world. And that's significant. It's not simply a Jewish command. Often when people raise the challenge that we're not Jews so we couldn't keep the Sabbath or it shouldn't be a binding one to us on us, that's pretty common. But right here, the command is set in a universal context. It's a fundamental human need. And God himself, when he ordered the creation around the seven-day week, himself entered into rest. And he was replenished, it says in Exodus. We don't think of God getting tired, but there's something about God's own rhythms and the world's rhythms and ours, Exodus, orients us to. This is fundamental. This is organic, deeply embedded in us. We are people who are made to rest. Uh, the second motivation in Deuteronomy. In Moses' sermons, Moses says, For you were slaves in Egypt, and I brought you out with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore you shall keep the Sabbath. So the second reason is particular to Israel. It's a part of their history. They were slaves. And what's so significant, as you know this story in Genesis, is that Pharaoh put burdens on them and gave them no rest. And so now here's Yahweh saying, but I'm not Pharaoh. I rescued you from that oppression. I gave you a good land and I gave you cycles of rest. It's a gift that you did not have. And so this... Um, Second reason for keeping it is not merely that the Lord made it and he himself rested, but that we have been born into it as a gift. That'll become significant when it comes to us gifting that rest to one another. Okay, so second, there are these two different um, motivations, and now there are two commands within the Ten Commandments. Now, this is true in Exodus and Deuteronomy. They repeat the two commands. One is to the Lord and one is to the neighbor. So the first is this, for the Lord sanctified, he said the, the Lord's day, the, um, the Sabbath is holy to the Lord. 
and so you shall keep the Sabbath. We sanctify time. Um, you may help to imagine the way as Israel wanders through life and through deserts and into um, Egypt and back out, that God gives them the midst of his presence with fire or with the tabernacle, with the ark that's holy to the Lord. Only the priests can go into this place. And it's that significant way that as we journey through the world, God is marking places where we can put our feet and know he's there. I mean, I think in this uh, COVID situation, we long, we intuitively know that it's different to be face to face with one another, to be in church, than or to do church at home. We're drawn, we're organically tied to place, and so God sanctifies place for us. And in the Sabbath, he sanctifies time. He hallows a day and says, it's mine. To the Lord is what we do. This is not um, simply that we rest. That's so significant. A day off and observing a sanctified day to the Lord are two very different things. God's not saying take a day off like Saturday or, or um, Labor Day tomorrow that we can just do what we want. That's not the Sabbath day. This is to me, the Lord says, my time. It's hallowed. So this um, gets really at the question of what can I do? You know, can I, can I enjoy myself on the Lord's day, on the Sabbath? As Christians call it, the Lord's day. Um, well, that really boils down to fundamentally, do we do it to the Lord? I mean, when we're in these events and these things that we do, are we sanctifying time? There ought to be something different about Sunday and Labor Day about the way we live, the way we value our time, the way we sanctify it and make it holy apart from other times. And if we do that, it seems to me there's a great deal of, of, um, of freedom. I can do a hike to myself, and I can do a hike on the Lord's Day to the Lord. I can sanctify the time to him. There's ways to do that. He draws us in, not simply out of um, a, a meaningless demand, but because we need the rest of being with him. And he longs to be with us. So the, the first command is to sanctify time to the Lord. The second is to give rest to ourselves and our neighbor. And it's the most interesting law in the Ten Commandments. It's the only one that says, I do benefit from this one. I mean, the rest of them, um, marriage and murder and theft and coveting, is about protecting my neighbor. But the Lord's Day is actually about the fact that I get to rest. I ought to observe this because I have a need that I may rest as well as your neighbor, is what the law says. And who's the neighbor? It's the only place in the Ten Commandments of all the laws that spells out the, the identity of the neighbor. It is your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or the sojourner, the refugee, the person from outside, the needy, if you get it. The neediest get to rest. That's radical in the ancient world, that they don't have to work and your ox, and your donkey, and your beast. You see the image of Genesis of that creative um, rest echoing in here. All of creation should be in a cycle of rest. All of creation has a right to be broken from and to be relieved from the demands and the burden and the consuming draw to labor. This is um, the centerpiece of social justice in the Old Testament. Um, Old Testament scholars often say that if you want to go to the Old Testament and find its images of justice and, and racial equality and of work for the poor, it's in the Sabbath law and in the prophets. Those two places hallow this thing. That's why I've selected for us um, Luke 4 for our, our gospel reading today, because in Luke, Jesus is beginning his public ministry with these words, he reads from the scroll of Isaiah, that passage I was mentioning before, Isaiah 56 to 58. These words are proclaimed of me. I proclaim release to the slave, um, freedom, sight to the blind. Uh, these are Sabbath images, a holy day in Isaiah. And Jesus says, I bring this into the midst of the world. He is our Sabbath. He's the son, is the son of man, is the Lord of the Sabbath. He's instituting something that Israel failed to do. And the Sabbath's absolutely at the center of that revelation. This is his first beginning of public ministry in Luke, the beginning of social justice. And here's what's really significant when you come back to hallowing the day to the Lord. Because when we hallow that time, we set apart. It says it has a demand on us. 
And then it brings us into a moment that the Lord does justice. The Sabbath is always a gathering. It's a community, a collection of people. Think about all the feasts, all the feasts, the, the, the seven-year Sabbath when debts are canceled, the jubilee when everybody goes back to their land that they've lost out of, um, out of devastation or famine or economic ruin. That refreshment is called the seven-year and the 49-year Sabbath. They're known as Sabbath laws. There's community renewal, economic renewal, a social gathering. And this is what binds the community together. And so the Sabbath isn't simply not working. It's the not working and rest that leads me to notice the needs of my neighbor that I might attend to them and be sure that they are replenished as we are rested also. The great calamity and perhaps one of the great reasons that we have failed in our economic and our racial and our social structure in America is that we're no longer communal people. I'm reading Cornell West, if you know him, the Harvard professor. He's a democratic socialist. He's pretty wild. And he gets right into the middle of ethnic problems in America and he blames not race or hatred. Those are roots, they're um, in the mix. They were already set in place. What's driving America's problems is our economic individualism. I will be successful and pleasurable, and I will do what I want on my holy day. We, this drive to independence no longer draws us by compulsion into doing justice. And so individualism wins across our framework. West goes on to say this, no democracy can survive, no matter how strong its markets, without serious public life, and commitment to fairness and justice. West names the love and the generosity that have been parts of our historic past. Reconstruction Black America, one of the most communal, beautiful sharing communities, crushed economically. We don't know how to love. We don't know how to meet face to face and empathize because we're living our own lives. This is probably a great point to point out if some of you are thinking of this. In the Old Testament, there was the possibility of the death penalty for disobeying the Sabbath. What a wild law. This is when we're always dismissing it, a little embarrassed by the Old Testament. But if you think about what's going on in Isaiah, when God says to them, I will bless you again and pull away my punishment if you cease to do your pleasure on my holy day. And what do you do, Isaiah says? You fight and you quarrel and you hit with a wicked fist. But what is my desire for the holy day and a fast day? To loosen bonds, to set the captive free. You see, the Sabbath, if we hallow time, as God commands us, we renew the tradition in Israel that puts us back to work resting and replenishing our neighbor. As soon as the Sabbath doesn't have command on us, no longer our neighbor does also. I set that before us today. These commands are not options for us. They command our attention and obedience because they're God's mechanisms to heal and attend to society, to sanctify time. Briefly, as I end, there are two rests. I took our reading from Hebrews 4 today, which is echoing Psalm 95, which we read every Sunday as the part of the prayer called the Venite. And it says, the writer of Hebrews, for if, if um, Joshua had given them or Moses had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day. I mean, it's really interesting. All throughout the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, God says, I'm taking you into a land of rest and a land of rest. But what happens is, is those laws are given to Israel when they're in the land. The laws simply assume massive economic inequality. They assume disaster, they assume famine, they assume prejudice. It's not a final rest. God knows that. There's a, it's a place of rest, it's a place for his presence, but he speaks of another day. He speaks of a final rest, that's what Hebrews says, which we enter into now by faith in Christ Jesus. There's a rest, friends, that waits for us. And when we try and find it in this world, we find an empty and a fleeting and a disappointing desire. There is a rest laid up that we wait for. 
it is often you think of that phrase, or I do this week, um, people are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good, which is very catchy, but it makes no sense. In Jesus' logic, when I understand the infinite riches and blessings and peace laid up for me in that rest, I can give away my life and take up my cross. It's precisely where Jesus goes with the rest. He invites us into this place. If I understand the rest that's laid up for me, I can understand and grasp and embrace the claim of my neighbor that they have for justice and rest and love and community and empathy. I end here as this Jesus who gives us rest has set one out for us and we wait in hope for that day to know too that right when he gives that moment, think in, uh, in Matthew chapter 11, he calls these disciples to himself and says, come to me. All you are heavy laden and weighed down and I will give you rest. For my burden is light and my load is heavy. Take up my yoke and learn from me. There's a, a study to be people of rest. Jesus goes immediately out into the fields and begins with his disciples on the Sabbath to pick grain. And Jesus says, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice. There's an invitation to the Lord. We await for a perfect rest. But that rest in Jesus, if we study him and know him and take this day, this sanctified day, to meet with him in prayer, he gives us rest now. It's available to us. It's um, present if we wait for it. And we call this day a delight and do the pleasures of the Lord. Amen.